seems to find new drivers in cancer, uh, and in particular uh, kinase uh, drivers in cancer because we're mostly interested in kinases. Um, so as we've, okay, as we've discussed several times already in this meeting, uh, kinase fusions or, or fusions in general are, are a result of uh, genomic instability in cancer, and we know of many examples of uh, strong drivers in cancer, uh, for example, BCR ABL or EML4 ALK uh, that are, that are uh, frequent in, in CML and lung adenocarcinoma respectively. Uh, and these are very strong drivers because the um, uh, uh, clinical trials and, uh, and approved TRPs associated with, uh, with these alterations are very successful TRPs uh, uh, to treat these, uh, these, um, these cancers. And RNA-seq data produced by the TCGA uh, is a very powerful data set to discover new kinase fusions, new fusions in general. And to date, there are more than 10,000 samples that have been sequenced in, in TCGA across 33 tumor types. Uh, so we sought to uh, find new kinase fusions uh, across this data set. Uh, and initially, I uh, used some of the uh, public, publicly available algorithms at the time in 2013. Uh, but for many of them, uh, either the time to, to run those algorithms were, was way too long, uh, above uh, a half a day or a day on, on um, a eight cores per sample. So that was really too much to run on the entire data set. Or they didn't have enough, uh, uh, um, uh, they were not sensitive enough to discover uh, all, the, all the fusions and they were missing uh, a lot of the known fusions. So we uh, sought to uh, develop a new algorithm that would be both very sensitive uh, and also um, very fast to be able to run across the entire data set. Um, and so we run it on, on, this, on this data set. There are a few of these uh, cancer types that are uh, still under embargo from the TCGS. So I'm not uh, going to present any results uh, about those, but uh, I will uh, have the, the, what I'm presenting is the data on all the remaining uh, samples. So rapidly what the algorithm is doing is really what, what all the kinase fusion uh, or uh, what all the fusion detection algorithms are, are doing. First, there is an alignment to the, uh, the, the genome uh, using our knowledge of the transcriptome. And this is done using the STAR uh, aligner, which is a, a very fast aligner. Um, uh, and so this, this is done. Uh, in, so conveniently, what, what the star aligner does is um, separating the, the aligned reads into two different BAM files, one containing all the um, reads, paired reads that align perfectly to the genome, and another BAM file that only contains the, the, the chimeric uh, reads that could be supportive of effusion. And then what the uh, fusion detection algorithm does is go through this uh, smaller BAM file only containing uh, reads that are, that are that are not aligning properly to the genome and finding if there are any pairs that could be supportive of a fusion. So in a sense, it, really disco it can discover any single fusion that, that is present in the data, and really the, the RNA-seq data are a very powerful uh, data set to, to, to discover uh, uh, fusions because uh, in the, um, there, is re there are really a lot of reads in, in the data that support these, uh, these fusions. And so in the final step of the, of the pipeline, there are some um, false, po there is some false positive detection that reduces the number of uh, false positive and passenger events that can be seen in the data, and I'm going to describe how that can be done. Um, so I want to s spend a minute really here because th these post-processing uh, tests uh, that are applied to the results are very important in, in order to discover what could be a real driver events in, uh, in those tumors as opposed to, to passenger or false positive events. So as I said, there's a first step in the pipeline is the fusion detection uh, step that is that, uh, where all the supporting reads for, for all the fusions are, are um, assembled and, and, um, and counted. Uh, and then in the post-processing step, there are heuristics to find first the passenger events, and these are real fusions that exist in the data, but that don't have the properties of, of real fusions. For example, they don't have an exon-exon junction, or their coding sequence is not in frame, or they're cutting through uh, uh, protein, protein domains, making the proteins unstable, or finally, in the case of kinase fusions, they, do not, they would not contain a kinase domain. And I, I want to stress on the fact that there are really many of these kinase fusions that exist in the data that do not contain a kinase domain. There are many examples of, of such recurrent uh, pseudo-fusions that are a result of a copy number amplification. 
uh, examples such as RPS6KV1 in breast cancer or other uh, kinases that are uh, known to be amplified do have some fusions in, in RNA-seq, but either they do not contain a kinase domain or they result in unstable proteins. So it is really important to, to check uh, whether the, the putative, um, uh, the translated sequence uh, could be supportive of a, of a uh, real protein uh, activating uh, event. Uh, in, a, in another step, there are also heuristics to filter out false positives, and this is done using uh, a large data set of normal samples, both from the TCGA, there are about 600 RNA-seq normal samples, and also from the GTEx data, there are 3,800 uh, samples that have been sequenced by, by the GTEx project, uh, and so the, the, the union of the both data sets, so I've, I've uh, run the, 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 the same pipeline, fusion detection pipeline on the, on the union of these two data sets to, to uh, discover what could be false positive events and, and, and uh, then filtered out anything that would appear at a certain frequency, above a certain frequency in those, in, in this data set. So in the end, uh, in the end, uh, there, there is a list of uh, kinase fusions that we think could be, pure, uh, that could be functional. Um, I also want to uh, mention one, one reason for some uh, false positives, which is the very high expression of one of the, the partner genes in the fusion, and those results in very non-specific uh, uh, fusion events between two genes that occur without a clear break, break point. So that is also a very frequent reason for which uh, some genes might, might, might appear as fused with others. So the output of the pipeline is, is presented here across um, the, the, the tumor types that, uh, across several tumor types, and uh, what, what I want to, to show is that there is, as expected, there is a very, uh, uh, the, 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 the frequency of uh, kinase fusions or recurrent kinase fusions varies greatly from one cancer to another. A thyroid cancer is, is uh, as, it, as it is known, is, uh, uh, contains uh, more than 13% uh, of, of such, such events. And on average, across cancers, across solid tumors, uh, there is ab about 2% of, uh, of recurrent kinase fusions. This, this is a plot that uh, presents the, the, the thresholds that have been applied in terms of the number of chimeric reads and, and split reads uh, to, to filter for fusions. Uh, and there, there are two, two things that I want to, to say here. One is the, the plot on the left presents the, the recurrent kinase fusions that have been discovered by the pipeline and the, the color code uh, separates those as uh, with known fusion, known f uh, kinase fusions uh, and in blue the novel kinase fusions that we've discovered. And there's, there really is no clear bias uh, in terms of the number of reads. So there, the, the, these, these novel events that we've discovered, they, they don't have less genomic evidence. Another thing I want to show is that the, the passenger and the, the singletons, so the, the non-recurrent kinase fusions that are present in the data, they tend to have lower number, uh, numbers of reads. So already the applying these thresholds is, is necessary to filter out a lot of the false positives, uh, but um, at, at the same time, we don't, want to miss, uh, no, we don't want to miss novel events. So this is the result of the, the entire pipeline presented in this, this matrix where the, the genes are, the, the recurrent kinase events are presented on the left across the 26 uh, tumor types at, uh, at the bottom. Uh, and there are four, roughly, so there are four uh, uh, types of fusions that I want to describe. First, the, the pipeline was able to recapitulate all the known fusions that, were, that had been described in, in all of these cancers, and uh, many of which have been already uh, uh, described today, such as the, the uh, RAF1 fusions or FGFR fusions. So we do find all of these events, uh, and all, all the fusions that had been described in the, in the TCGA papers and others uh, have been recapitulated by the, by the pipelines, with a few notable events. For example, the PRKACA fusions that have been discovered last year in uh, fibrolamellar HCC. There are six examples of those in the, the TCGA data, two of which are annotated as fibrolamellar uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Two are annotated as, as uh, HCC, and two do not have uh, clinical annotations in the, in the TCGA. Uh, other, uh, so, so there, there are many um, events that we were able to recapitulate this way. Uh, second, there are novel fusions, uh, there are fusions that were uh, involving known kinases 
um, but for which we found new, new partners, and that is really a recurrent theme uh, for, for many of the fusion finding efforts. There, there really are um, a lot of uh, uh, gene partners that, that tend to be uh, fused with, uh, with kinases and other genes in general, so that is really a message for um, diagnostic efforts to find those fusions because they cannot be specific for just one, uh, one uh, driver gene and its partner. They need to be really uh, agnostic of the, the partner gene. Third, uh, and more importantly, there are some novel indications where we found some of the, the, the fusions that were known before. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, red fusions uh, could be found in colorectal adenocarcinoma uh, or, or um, Breast, uh, breast carcinoma. Uh, another example uh, is the in, uh, FG43 fusions that could be found in prostate cancer uh, in, uh, in one sample. So really there, there are several examples of, of these fusions uh, uh, at low frequency in other cancers. Uh, and finally and, and most importantly, there are some novel examples of, uh, of kinase fusions with uh, genes that were not known to be, uh, to be involved in fusions before. Um, first, uh, MET and PIK3CA, which are obviously known oncogenes, uh, are and that were not known to be involved in fusions before. Uh, we found uh, several fusions uh, for these two genes, six fusions in MET and, and four in PIK3CA. But there are also some other kinase fusions that, are, that we believe are, uh, are drivers in, in those samples uh, that are involved in uh, kinases that were not known to be associated with cancer before. And an example is FGR, for which I'm, I'm showing here four, um, four, four samples that, that harbor uh, fusions of FGR. There is also a fifth one in a, in a uh, cancer type that has not been uh, uh, released by TCGA yet. So quickly, I want to go through a few of the examples. Uh, in red, we were able to uh, uh, describe some novel indications. Uh, these are plots that describe the putative uh, uh, sequence of, the, of the, 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 the protein, the predicted protein. Uh, these, so these are known uh, partner genes, CCDC6 and ERK1, uh, in respectively colorectal adenocarcinoma and breast cancer. They contain the uh, cold coil domain that, uh, uh, cause RET to dimerize and autoactivate. We found other, these are examples of novel partners for, for RET fusions. They contain the kinase domain. They contain also, uh, the partner gene contributes coiled coil domains that create, the, that uh, cause uh, RET to, to dimerize and autoactivate. Uh, so these are all in steroid carcinoma. These, these are examples of the, 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 the filters that we apply to verify that uh, these fusions are functional. I also want to describe an example of uh, MET, the, the, sorry, MET and PIK3CA fusions, starting with uh, PIK3CA actually. Uh, these fusions are interesting because they are really five prime UTR fusions. Um, in in uh, uh, some examples, TBL1 XR1 is contributing only the five prime UTR exon and it is fused with the, the first, uh, the, the exon two, but which is also five prime UTR in PIK3CA, so really the entire uh, coding sequence of PIK3CA is expressed in, in those fusions. And it has the effect of overexpressing PIK3CA as is shown in these three plots. Uh, here uh, shown in, in breast cancer where PIK3CA is known of course to be uh, mutated and, and amplified. This would be a third way of, of activating uh, PIK3CA uh, by fusions where we see that the two samples in red and also with the arrows harboring the fusions are among the, the highest expressors of PIK3CA. And it, the, the, this, the same is true for um, the two other uh, tumor types. With MET, uh, the, the two, so we found two examples in kidney papillary uh, carcinoma where MET is known to be uh, a driver, highly mutated. Uh, these, these examples of uh, uh, MET fusions contain a cold coil domain that is causing MET to, to dimerize and auto-activate. Auto there are also four other cancer types in which we found uh, MET fusions, but this one is particularly interesting because MET was already known to be a driver there. This is, uh, an additional evidence that the PIK3CA fusions are real. Uh, the, the, the four samples uh, are, are shown on the, on the left. These are only the reads that are involved in the, in the fusion, so only chimeric and split reads involved in the uh, PIK3CA fusions, uh, showing here the, the UTR, 5 prime UTR of PIK3CA, so these really are promoter fusions causing overexpression of PIK3CA. And lastly, I want to show an example of this uh, novel fusion that we discovered between WASF2 and FGR. 
so this is also an example of a five prime UTR fusion uh, akin to the pic 3 ca fusions that I just described. Uh, WASF2, uh, sorry, FGR is a Sark family kinase. Uh, it is known to be highly expressed in some hematopoietic cells uh, and some cancers as well. Uh, it had, had not been, invo uh, been involved with, uh, with cancer and had not been uh, previously implicated with cancer, so we don't really know its role or anything uh, in, in cancer. However, uh, we know that it's a viral oncogene homologue, so it could potentially be, be oncogenic. The uh, five fusions that we found in the TCGA data set across five different tumor types are all in the, in the form of WASF2 fused with FGR, so this is a strong argument that, that this very recurrent event uh, could be oncogenic. Uh, again, as I've shown with pic 3 ca the same is true with FGR. The, uh, the samples in which the fusions are present overexpress FGR at uh, uh, almost the highest level without a copy number amplification. Uh, this is the, the fifth tumor type that I was talking about. Uh, and interestingly, we have also found this fusion in uh, a, a cell line and also uh, because we were talking about the clinical implications of some of the TCGA work earlier, uh, we have been, we are collaborating with a large um, hospital that has included FGR in their, uh, in their clinical sequencing panel, and these fusions have also been found in, in patients. So we have really, uh, we're, we're uh, hopeful that this could be uh, discovered in additional tumor types, uh, may, maybe at higher frequencies than, than the frequencies that I've shown here. Uh, and finally, because I'm over time, I'm track and track one, two, three fusions are uh, recurrent across several cancers. This is uh, the same theme as uh, FGFR fusions that are recurrent across cancers. Uh, so, so this really underlines the, the necessity of, of looking for, for these fusions in, in more than just specific tumor types uh, for, for diagnostic purposes. So finally, I want to, to um, summarize the, my this talk and two with uh, two two parts. One, these there there were uh, updates to the, the the study we published last year uh, that I presented today. Um, for uh, first, there were additional tumor types that were analyzed so that I presented here. The one thing that I didn't talk about is the FGFR2 fusions are found in cholangiocarcinoma at a, at a frequency of about 10 percent. And cholangiocarcinoma is a uh, uh, one of these six new cancer types presented here. JAK1 fusions are also novel. They were not uh, described before, and there are two that, uh, that, uh, that we found in two different cancer types between IG14 and JAK1. Uh, there are two novel FGR fusions compared to the, the study we had published, uh, and also the PRKCA fusions in, in liver cancer are, are a very important feature uh, in, in, this, uh, in this analysis because uh, there are six uh, six of these fusions in the, in the liver cancer data set. And finally, some, some uh, uh, broader implications of this work. This was the first, first pan cancer fusion analysis. Uh, we focused on, on kinase events because these are strong drivers uh, of the disease, and we believe that this could have profound, the discovery of novel fusions could have profound implications for diagnosis, uh, treatment, and drug discovery. Uh, finally, I want to uh, thank the Cancer Genome Atlas because none of this would have been possible without the, this data being publicly available. And also, I want to thank uh, my other colleagues at Blueprint, starting with uh, Christoph Lingauer, our CSO, uh, and other colleagues that have participated in this work. Thank you. Uh, Nico, great talk and really a great illustration of how the, the TCGA. Um, uh, data can be used beyond the network and, and in drug discovery. Um, so uh, thank you. And I was really interested by um, uh, this uh, FGR fusion uh, because one of the things that's been really mysterious to me, you know, for the last 20 years or so doing cancer genomics is where are the activating SARC family kinase alterations in the human cancer genome? And this could be, to my knowledge, the first one. And so what I'd like to know next is what's the evidence that these FGFR fusions are functionally important? And if there is evidence, are you at liberty to share any of it? So what, what I can say is that we're, we're working on it. <laughs> the second thing I want to say is that uh, actually some papers coming out of your lab showed that FGR was one of the genes that went over express could induce resistance to, to some therapies. Absolutely, yeah, uh, <laughs> resistance to erlotinib therapy. Right. Uh, but it's not, it's, and if I recall correctly, 
it's in a region of amplification in some EGFR mutant lung cancers as well. Right, and so, so this, this is, I, I think these uh, cancer types are not the ones where we're going to find FGR fusions that are high frequency. There might be a rare cancer type, just like FLHCC, where FGR is a main driver event. Uh, there are no activating mutations that have been described in, in the, the, the TCGA. There are really very few events. Uh, yes, it's, it is an interesting, interesting event. Actually, my question is uh, related to this and goes along with the idea of uh, trying to infer which of these fusions are really driving uh, and having a major impact for the tumors harboring them. Uh, have you tried to look at the local uh, uh, amplification of status of the fusion genes? Because one of the points we always find is that those that seem to have then a biological uh, dominant function, uh, uh, clearly those fusions uh, don't show these broad amplification events. They show extremely microfocal amplification events uh, that uh, typically involve uh, uh, one or sometimes both of the regions uh, implicated in the fusion genes. So have, have you tried to go uh, on SNP array, you know, high density SNP array, and see whether you can identify very focal amplification events on uh, the fusion genes. Right, so for, for the known fusions, I haven't done this work, but for the novel ones, I've been looking at them particularly closely to know if there were some amplifications that could, ex that could maybe cause these to be artifacts of, uh, that could maybe cause the fusions to be artifacts in the amplification, and it, it is not the case. There are no amplifications, or there are maybe broad amplifications around the gene but no focal amplifications. However, the, the SNP arrays are not the, 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 the uh, definition of the, the SNP arrays is not sufficient to really see uh, the, the, these events at a very, at a very uh, yeah, to, to, to see very small events. The other thing I can share is that uh, there is one sample uh, harboring an FGR fusion that has whole genome sequencing and I, uh, so for one of these five, there is whole genome sequencing, and I was able to see also the fusion in, in that sample, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be just a, 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 a chromosomal break without amplification. I mean, sometimes even on SNP 6.0, if you go to the single probe uh, level, you can actually find uh, those type of things. Uh, but it's true, if you do a standard uh, segmentation, it can be very complex. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. and. Um, and, and enjoy your lunch and please come back at 2.25. Thank you. <laughs>